good morning. I am the one and only Kenny Bowles. Hold it down. I have my cheering section on the front row here, but, but the man, the myth, the disappointment. So three and a half years ago, I stood on this platform and preached my final chapel sermon. Done. Over. Won't ever have to do that anymore. <laughs> and my lovely wife, Linda, was standing here and she got the flowers and, and I got the plaque and we walked off into the sunset. Done. Finished. Never have to do that again. <clears throat> so this is my final chapel sermon. Okay, okay, final. <laughs> so listen closely, because this is it. <laughs> Give it up, Jesus. Just throw in the towel. There's no need for you to be out here in this desert starving yourself to death. Forty days and forty nights and no food. And any one of these rocks you could turn into a loaf of bread. And the only thing standing between you and food is this ridiculous mission that you have taken on, and you don't need to do this. You don't have to leave all of that and come down here for all of this. Any time you want to, you can walk away, and no one would blame you. Give it up. Eat a rock. <laughs> Enjoy yourself. At times I have wondered how hard was it for Jesus not to give it up. And I think what we ought to do this morning before we get to our official text and official sermon, which is about, oh, I don't know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes away. So when we get to the real sermon, I'll let you know. <clears throat> we are going to take a uh, brief stroll through the Gospel of John, just noticing times and places where Jesus really should have just thrown in the towel. Give it up, Jesus. John chapter 1. The Word was with God and the Word was God, and He had made everything. It was all His. And He was life and the life was a light of men, and he came to be the light of the world, and the darkness tries to put it out. They don't want light. They like darkness. And he came unto his own. That's John chapter 1, a few verses later. He came unto his own, and they that were his own received him not. He came to the blind darkness, and the darkness said, get out of here. He came to God's own covenant people. 1,500 years they've been in covenant with God, and they don't want him either. Give it up, Jesus. Just walk away. John chapter 2. He has some disciples. He's invited to a wedding feast at Cana of Galilee. He's ready to kind of launches public ministry, ready to go. Here I am, I'm Jesus, I've got my disciples. And his mother says, honey, they're out of wine. He came for this, really. And later in John chapter 2, there's a cleansing of the temple. You've got God's holiest people, his most pious scholars, his most powerful leaders in Jerusalem at the temple. And what have they done with God's house? 
turned it into a barnyard. Give it up, Jesus, they're not worth it. John chapter 3. Nicodemus, the best and brightest of the men in Israel. And he comes to Jesus by night to ask, you know, what's this all about? And what do I need to do? And all that kind of stuff. And Jesus has the answer, you must be born again. Unless you are born of the water and the blood, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus, the best and brightest, listens to Jesus' simple explanation, you've got to be born again. I, he doesn't get it. Give it up, Jesus. If the best and the brightest don't understand what you're saying, what's the point? It's like me in a Greek class at 7 o'clock in the morning, and I'm writing declensions on the board, and I turn around, and half of them have fallen asleep. Just give it up. So I did. <laughs> <clears throat> John chapter 4. There is a woman at the well. She, at least, after a little bit of resistance, starts to uh, listen to Jesus because she knows how badly she needs help. But really now, if you're going to come to save people and the only people you're getting so far are Samaritans, Give it up, Jesus. They're not worth it. John chapter 5, there's a lame man at the pool. Do you want to be healed? Why, yes, sir, I believe I do. And so Jesus heals him right there immediately. And uh, it's a Sabbath. And Jesus slips away in the crowd and the commotion, finds a man later and introduces himself, gives him a couple words of advice. And as soon as the lame man has found out who Jesus is, he immediately runs to turn Jesus in to the authorities. Give it up, Jesus, they don't appreciate you. John chapter 6, the feeding of 5,000, the only miracle that is in all four Gospels. Walks on water. At the synagogue, the next day, he preaches a sermon on the bread of life. Eat my flesh, drink my blood, or you have no life in you. And, of course, the people didn't get it. And when they didn't get it, they didn't trust him enough to want to listen for more. They didn't hang around to stay with him even when they couldn't understand it all. John 6:66, 6, and from that time, many of his disciples went away, and they followed him no longer. Jesus even had to turn to the twelve and say, would you also go away? Give it up, Jesus. You're not getting anywhere. This is... This is the beginning of the third year of Jesus' ministry. When people are walking away in droves. Let's have the invitation. Everybody come forward. And everybody gets up and walks away. For good. John 7. And we find out that Jesus' own brothers don't <laughs> believe in him. How's that? What, did Mary forget to tell them about the virgin birth? Did Joseph forget to tell them about the angel Gabriel, the trip to Egypt, God's protection, all of that? I, I, I really don't quite get it, but Jesus has four brothers, and not a one of them believe in him. If your own family won't back you, what's the point? John chapter 8. You get down to about verse 31, and it explains that Jesus is talking to the Jews who had believed in him. This is, this is not an angry group of Pharisees. These are not self-righteous Sadducees. These are the Jews who had believed in him. And he's discussing with them, 
and you get just a couple of paragraphs on into it. He's talking about Abraham, rejoice to see my day. What do you mean Abraham saw your day? You've seen Abraham? I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was, I am. And these Jews who had believed in him picked up stones to stone him to death. Give it up, Jesus. These people are never going to believe you. They're never going to submit to you. Your own believers, believers, want to kill you. John chapter 9. His disciples are idiots. <laughs> Walking along in Jerusalem, here's a blind man begging. Well, my goodness, Jesus, who do you suppose sinned, that man or his parents, so that he was born blind? That man maybe was the one who sinned so that he would be born blind. Okay, makes sense to me. <laughs> Or the parents may be saying, honey, wouldn't you like to have a blind baby? I've always thought a blind baby would be a great thing to have, so why don't we sin and then we... So <laughs> Jesus <clears throat> heals this blind man. And by the way, this is not the first blind man that Jesus has healed. His disciples have seen him heal blind men before, and this time they come, and here's the beggar, the blind man, and they're wondering this theological question, whose fault is it, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Why aren't they expecting a miracle? John chapter 10, the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And the good shepherd who says, I am come that you might have life and have it abundantly, have it to the full. And to this day, a large percentage of followers of Jesus still believe that it is his job to make them happy. It is his job to make them healthy and wealthy and wise. And any time he fails on that, there's something wrong with him. Because that's what Christianity is all about. Me having an abundant life. <laughs> Give it up, Jesus. They're never going to understand. John chapter 11. Oh, here's something else in John 10, verse 24. If you are the Christ, tell us plainly, verse 31. And they took up stones to stone him. Now, John 11. We're going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And when Lazarus has been brought back to life before the amazed and astonished eyes of his sisters and their friends and the Jews from around who had come to comfort him, It doesn't take very long before verse 46. Some of them ran and told the Pharisees. Verse 47, the chief priest and the whole Sanhedrin meet and they decide that Jesus must die. Why? Because he raised a man from the dead. And in the next chapter, they're going to decide they need to kill Lazarus too. Give it up, Jesus, they're going to kill you. Verse chapter 12, it is a triumphal entry, and people come up, hundreds, thousands, thronging from Jerusalem, and a crowd coming with Jesus, and they're coming together, and it's a tremendous, wonderful occasion, and Hosanna, the King of Kings, blah, 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 because within five days, within five days, the crowds will be calling, crucify him, crucify him. Give it up, Jesus. People are so fickle. They come blubbering and crying and wanting to be saved and wanting you to be their savior. And the next thing you know, they've turned their back and they've walked away. Just 
give it up. Verse 37 of chapter 12. Even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. A lame man, a blind man, a dead man. What else do you want? Chapter 13. It is time to wash the disciples' feet. And Jesus girds himself with a towel, and on his knees with a basin of water, he is washing the feet of Matthew and James and Andrew. Peter, of course, objects. He's washing the feet of Judas Iscariot. He is humbling himself before Judas Iscariot. And the supper is not even halfway over. The water between Judas's toes is hardly even dry. When he jumps up and bolts out into the darkness to sell Jesus for, I don't know, what do you suppose the Son of God would be worth? You know, on the open market. 30 coins? Yeah, that's about right. Give it up, Jesus. You can't even want to save people like that. John 14. And Jesus is talking about my father's house. And I go to prepare a place for you. And he's talking about heaven and he's talking about a wonderful future. And he says... And you know the way. And Thomas says, no, we don't. (laughs) And Jesus says, you know me, you know my father, you know him and have seen him. And Philip says, no, we haven't. Lord, show us the father and we will be content. Give it up, Jesus. They will never learn. John 15 Now, I was going through my book of John, and I couldn't find anything wrong in John 15. You know why? It's all red letters. (laughs) That's it. I didn't want to find anything wrong there. I can't complain. (laughs) John chapter 16, and uh, some black letters in verse 17. And some of his disciples said, "What what does he mean? And verse 18, they kept asking, what does he mean? Give it up, Jesus. People are stupid. John 17, it's all red letters again. This is the prayer of Jesus. But this time, remember, at the end of Jesus' prayer, he prays for all those who will believe through the testimony of the disciples and others. And he prays that they might all be one, that the world may know that you have sent me. One of the final requests of Jesus' life, I won't say it was his final prayer because Gethsemane is yet to come, but Jesus' virtual dying request is that his followers be united as one, and here 2,000 years later, we still haven't pulled it off. Give it up, Jesus. Your prayers are going unanswered. John 18, here comes Judas. Hundreds of Roman soldiers and Jewish temple guards. He is arrested. He is forsaken by the 11 disciples. He is denied in the courtyard of the high priest by Peter. He is condemned by the Sanhedrin. He is ignored by Pilate. What is truth? And Pilate turned his back on the Son of God and walked away. He is traded for Barabbas. Give it up, Jesus. In God's name, what's the use? John 19, he is scourged with those terrible Roman whips. He is mocked by the soldiers. He is presented by Pilate, behold the man only to be rejected by the crowds, crucified by the soldiers, crucified by the entire human race. 
because you and I had a part in the crucifixion of Jesus. Give it up. Give it up, Jesus, while there's still time. Give it up and no one would blame you. Come down from that cross, they mocked. Why didn't he, for goodness sake? And then the most remarkable thing. On the cross, hanging there for hours, he calls, he calls for a sponge with some wine vinegar on it to wet his tongue and wet his lips so that he can cry out what has been called the most important word ever uttered on the most important day in the history of the world by the most important man that ever lived. Tetelestai. Say what? Tetelestai. It is finished. It is finished. Now we're ready for the sermon proper. It is finished. The deed is done. If you were to rummage around in some of the ancient Greek writings before and during the time that Jesus was on the earth, you would run across the writings of Homer in the Odyssey when they were fighting this battle for the city of Troy. Remember the Trojan horse and all of that? And Odysseus announced the plans to enter the battle. And Homer writes, the moment the word was said, the deed was done. Tetelestai. No sooner said than done. Oh, but in the life of Jesus, it was not quite that quick. It was said by God, and Jesus faithfully, faithfully, faithfully endured until finally from the cross he could say back to his father who had sent him on this mission, the deed is done, it is finished, tetelestai. It is finished when a commander's orders have been executed. Josephus writes in uh, Wars of the Jews that there was a time down in Alexandria when the Roman troops rushed into the Jewish quarter, section of town where the Jews lived, and they executed their orders to Telestai, but not without loss of blood. Some of the soldiers died. And in this case, Jesus had been given orders by his commander, his father. And he could now say with great loss of blood, the orders have been executed to Telestai. It is finished. The mission is accomplished. The enemy is defeated. The victory is won. It is finished when a plan has been carried out. I love this one now in 3rd Maccabees where it gets a little wild. We read that Ptolemy has a plan to destroy the Jews. And his plan is to take all of the war elephants that he has and get them drunk and stampede them into the Jewish forces. So what's not to like about a bunch of drunk elephants? <laughs> and when the plan was carried out to Telestai, when the plan is carried out, God sent angels to protect the Jews. But now when Jesus carries out a plan, it is to save God's people, not destroy them. And when he had carried out the plan, he cried out, Tetelestai, it is finished. It is finished when wrath has been satisfied. At the battle for Troy, back at that ancient city, Homer's writing this time in the Iliad, how King Agamemnon would fulfill his wrath. You know what the word would be when wrath has been fulfilled? to Telestai. And then in book four, Achilles is told this, even if someone swallows his wrath for the day, yet he holds resentment in his heart until he 
brings it all to pass, though the wrath has been simmering, though the anger has been smoldering. Finally, finally it must be satisfied, and when the wrath is satisfied, the word is to telestai. Lamentations 4.11, the Lord has completed his wrath to telestai. Revelation 15.1, as well as at the cross, the wrath of God is satisfied to telestai. To finish rebuilding the temple in Ezra chapter 5, to telestai. To carry out the laws of a lawgiver in Plato, to telestai. To fulfill a promise, 2 Ezra 1, to telestai. To fulfill sacred rites in Euripides is called to telestai. And then there is my favorite. When they were digging in the dry sands of Oxyrhynchus, they, they kept digging up scraps of papyrus. This was handmade paper. This was uh, everyday letters, everyday uh, legal documents, uh, just all kind of paper stuff that is found. And they kept finding scraps of paper with one particular word written across that. Probably can guess what that word was. It was tetelestai. Now, why would they write tetelestai on these scraps of paper? Because it was like this scrap of paper. If archaeologists someday unearth Arvest Bank and open up all the safety deposit boxes, they will find scraps of paper like this one. It's an old promissory note. I bought a car. I borrowed money. I owed a debt. I could not pay, but I worked at it. And finally, finally, when the debt was paid, they took their little stamp, and I don't know if you can see it down there, but it is stamped paid, paid in full. When a debt is paid, it is to telestai. When a plan is carried out, when a promise is kept, when a work is finished, it is to telestai. And from the cross, the cry of victory from Jesus Christ our Lord rings across the centuries. The mission on which he was sent, the job he was told to do, the victory that he was responsible to win, and the debt he had to pay it was finished. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for Jesus Christ, your Son, who came to be our Savior and paid our debt and won our war and kept your promise and cried out in victory. Father, help us in Christ to live the victorious life which he died to give us. Help us, Father, to love him, to follow him, to believe him, to honor him with our lives. And even as he never gave up and never quit, so may we never quit on him. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.